Thank you for the blood of Jesus. Everything we need, we find in you, Lord. This place today, it is the cure for the ills of society. It is what nations need. It is what neighborhoods need. Thank you, Sister Karen. Thank you for that anointed singing. I turn your attention this morning to the book of Matthew, chapter 26. We begin reading in verse 69. Matthew, chapter 26, and verse 69. Now Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel came unto him, saying, Thou also... And when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto them that were there, This fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man, them, for thy speech betrayeth thee. Then began he to curse the rooster crowed. And Peter and he went out and wept bitterly. I'd like to speak this morning on this subject, the margins of a mistake. We are thankful, Lord, for all that you did for our salvation. And now we've come together in this house under the banner of your name to proclaim your glory and greatness. We ask you, God, that you would touch hearts and minds to receive your word. Give us courage to act upon it, Lord, and we'll give you praise for all things. In Jesus' name, Everybody said amen. amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. The narrative of by Jesus to be a disciple, he was an unlikely candidate to start a spiritual revolution with, fuss without provocation. If you read the gospel, who challenged the street? Peter reminded Jesus of something that Jesus already knew. Master, the crowd has thronged you, and you ask, who touched you? I feel that same virtue in this room today was healed. It was Peter in the presence of others who reminded He usually voiced what the others may have been thinking but would never say. So it should come as no surprise to us that Peter began to unravel his circle of 12 union and then washed their feet. Peter again protested, refused to have his feet washed went to that expressed his desire for all of God. At this same supper, when Jesus said by proclaiming that before the rooster would crow, signaling the oncoming of the new day, Peter would deny would not, not Peter. Things went downhill from there as the temple guard came to arrest Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. Later that night, Peter grabbed his sword and swung it in the general vicinity of the approaching men. It found the ear of one of the young men in the act and this act of aggression and he reached down to the ground and retrieved the bloody ear and reattached it to the young man's head. He told Peter to put away his sword. After the arrest, the other disciples this Peter had for Christ in spite of these numerous mistakes. As is in the courtyard of this palace warming himself by the fire with some of the other staff and onlookers. It's here that Peter was recognized Recognize. He, he was wanting to just blend in with the crowd and be incognito. After the third denial, Peter felt the crush of the words that Jesus had told him earlier that night. He felt the sting of the stare as Jesus was led out of Caiaphas' house through the courtyard and past Peter. All of the mistakes and shortcomings of Peter came crashing down on him and he went out into the night and wept bitterly we read that shortly after this he gets his buddies together and they go fishing their old profession their hobby their stress reliever something about the smell of the galilee the feel of the ropes the lines the nets in the hands of peter and his friends it was Therapeutic. It was home. It was a safe place. But it was not the same. After you've been touched by Jesus, the old things are just not the same. Something was different. The camaraderie between Peter and his comrades was missing, not to mention the fish were also missing. 
You can't really enjoy fishing for long with empty nets. It seems ironic, if not irrational, that in spite of these mistakes, it's Peter who Jesus asked for by name upon his resurrection. It's Peter who becomes the lead apostle in less than two months and preaches on the day of Pentecost as the Holy Spirit is poured out in Jerusalem and Acts chapter 2 tells the story. It's Peter who the servants of Cornelius, a Roman centurion, seek for in Acts chapter 10 to bring the gospel to the Romans. It's Peter that brings the salvation message to the Jews, the Gentiles, and the Samaritans at the instruction of Jesus following these mistakes. Make no mistake about it. The shortcomings and stumbles of Peter did not disqualify him from the service of the Messiah. In fact, it may have prepared him. We know what margins are. You can't get through college without wrestling with term papers and making sure that the margins are correct. Yes, margins are that space on either side of the text that you have in your Bible. You have margins on the either side of the notes. But margins are more than just white space on paper. Margins are space, distance, and amounts in life. We sometimes refer to a margin of victory. Billy Horschel won the Masters by a margin of three strokes. That may just be wishful thinking. Billy Horschel is Brother Richie, our assistant pastor's nephew. And today is the final round of the Masters Golf Tournament in Augusta, Georgia. The Miami Dolphins won the Super Bowl by a margin of 14 points. That really is wishful thinking. In finance, margin is the collateral that a holder of a financial instrument has to deposit with a counterparty to cover some or all of the credit that the mortgage holder is requiring. In the business world, margin is the difference between the price at which a product is sold and the cost associated with making or selling the product. A margin is a limit in condition or capacity beyond or below which something cease to exist, be desirable, or be possible. The margin of endurance, the margin of sanity, the margins of a mistake. We think of mistakes as being disqualifiers, deal breakers, a death sentence as it were. Not a sentence that God or even society imposes, but rather a sentence that we impose upon ourselves. Notwithstanding the fact that there are consequences to wrong choices, I ask you this rhetorical question today, is it possible that your mistakes have a limited capacity? The mistakes gain momentum when we, not God, not the Word, when we, you and I, remove the margins. The difference between Judas who betrayed the Lord and went out and hung himself that night and, and Peter who denied the Lord and was restored, the difference between those two individuals is that Judas removed the margin by assuming that his mistake was a death sentence. But Peter found that his mistakes had margins. They had a limited capacity. They would not define him, they would not remove him, and they would not separate him from the love of God. I rise today on this resurrection morning to declare to you that your mistakes do not have to define you. God has a calling for everybody under the sound of my voice today and you do not have to live under the shadow of a past mistake.
This is what Paul learned, that even though his enormous mistakes of executing young men who preached the gospel was a hideous crime, it had a margin. Paul declares in the closing words of Romans chapter 8, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's a pretty exhaustive list. That's a pretty wide margin. But in spite of that impressive show of powerful obstacles, it all has limitations. And I tell you today that whatever has happened to you or is happening to you or will happen to you, it all has a limiting capacity. But there is something that is greater. And we sang about it today. It is the blood of Jesus. I tell you today, there's bigger sins than yours. That are beneath the blood of Jesus. Perhaps the most formidable of all of these that Paul recounts in Acts 8 is death. Death is a pretty substantial occurrence or consequence. But today, on this resurrection morning, we celebrate that even death became limited when Jesus resurrected. Even death has a limited capacity when Jesus is involved. When the power of abundant life collided with death, death had to bow. Death lost its grip. Death was defeated. Death was marginalized because there was a greater power Oh, I'm thankful that I know a greater power than my mistakes. I know a greater power than my faults. I know a greater power than my shortcomings. It is the Holy Ghost. It is the Holy Ghost and fire. It is the blood of Jesus. Woo, hallelujah. If Jesus can put a margin on death, don't you think he can limit the ramifications of your mistake? After the earth and its inhabitants, because of the sin of humanity, were destroyed by the great flood, save Noah and his family, the margin was created when God put a rainbow in the sky and said the earth will never be destroyed again by water. The mistakes of David are heralded and scriptured and across pulpits, but what is often hidden in the narrative is the fact that God would not allow the mistakes to destroy David. After he's confronted by the prophet Nathan in 2 Samuel 12, it says in verse 13, David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan the prophet said unto David, the Lord also hath put away your sin. Thou shalt not die. When David messed up again later on in life as the leader of Israel, the Lord put a margin on it. 2 Samuel 24, 16. And when the angel stretched down his hand upon Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord repented him of the evil and said to the angel that destroyed the people, it is enough. I feel God saying to some wonderful people at East Twin Pentecostal this morning, he is saying to your sin, it is enough. He is saying to your past, it is enough. You are a new creature in Christ Jesus. You are more than a conqueror. But he goes even further. Not only can God limit the destruction of a mistake, but he can use the mistake to make you stronger, to make you better. When God restores, he doesn't restore to just a level playing field. God restores to a greater position of power and authority. Man died spiritually the moment he disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden, but it was restored through the blood of Jesus. And when God restores, it's always with increase a double portion 
multiplication and improvement so that the restoration is greater than the prior state of brokenness. Let me give you some examples in the word of God. When the temple was destroyed in Jerusalem the first time, the Lord said, the glory of the new house will gain is because the latter rain comes after a time of drought. The latter rain has the restoration properties of God nature. Oh, I'm so thankful I serve a God that can restore. He can restore us through the power of the Holy Ghost so that we are in the image of Christ Jesus, a place we can never get to with our own strength or ability. But because of the blood, because of a resurrected Savior, we are restored to a greater position. The Bible says that Satan as a thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. But Jesus came to give, watch this now, life more abundantly. You got to get this. We receive our life from God when we're born, but then the thief comes and we stumble. Greater life. When we're born, we receive a human spirit. But when we're born again, when we're saved, we receive a Holy Spirit. He gets better and better. He gets sweeter and sweeter. He gets greater and greater. Jesus. After Job was restored, he received double the blessing. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 2, Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The NIV version says, Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way to the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted. Every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall be made straight. And the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. Why does he restore us to a greater capacity? Why does he put a limitation upon your sin? It's because the glory of God is going to fill all the earth. And all the flesh shall see. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. And it shall Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 12. Turn you to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. Even today do I declare that I will render double unto thee. We know that God uses the natural to illustrate the spiritual. When my son Gregory broke his arm as a young boy, we took him to the orthopedic surgeon, and the doctor said the arm will heal, but it'll come back stronger than the other arm. We inquired as to how that could happen, doctor. And he explained that the blood in the human body brings marrow cells to the point of the break and layers it over and over until the bone is stronger than it was before. Oh, my friend, the blood of Jesus has healing properties in it. It comes to the point of your mistake and it layers it over and over with mercy. It layers it over and over with grace. It layers it over and over with forgiveness so that you're coming out of this trial with a testimony. Your days are not limited. You don't have to live under the shadow of a past sin. You are more than a conqueror through Christ that loves you. I come to prophesy to somebody today, uh, the healing properties of God are going to make you stronger emotionally, stronger spiritually, stronger mentally. This is not the hill that you will die on. You will rise again and fight another day. (laughs) 
What the enemy meant for evil, God meant for good. The story is told of Stephen and Paul meeting each other in heaven. Stephen is upset that the guy who arranged his execution is sharing the same streets of gold. What is Paul doing here? Why is he in heaven? Peter comes up and says, Stephen, I understand how you feel. I was there when your life was taken as a young man. I heard the crushing sound of the stones destroying your flesh. Natural life ended for you there, but the gospel did not. You see, Stephen, your life purchased the transformation of Paul. He wrote the majority of the New Testament. He took the gospel to the then known world. He was the apostle to the Gentiles. The gospel covered the world because of the price you paid, Stephen. You gave your life and that life purchased the salvation of millions of people. A friend of mine pastors in St. Louis, Missouri. He lost his son, his successor, his music director to cancer a year and a half ago. A few weeks ago, a man walked into their church and said, and I quote, you can tell the worship in this place is expensive. There has been a great price paid for the presence of God that you feel in this place. Life is full of mistakes. Life is littered with unexplained crosses and crises. Some are the result of our own doing and some are not. But the good book says all things work together for good. I said all things work together for good. The things that I had a part of and things I didn't have a part of, but all things. Somebody say all things. Not just some things, not just the good things. But all things work together for good uh, to them that are called according to his purpose. I say to this great congregation today, let God turn the mistake into a miracle. Let God turn the pain into a promise. Let God transform a crucifixion into a resurrection. Come on, let God turn the hurt into healing. Let God turn the brokenness into blessing. Let God transform what you thought was the end is really just the beginning. I said it's just the beginning. I know it was a heavy price, but God's got a destiny for you. God's got a calling for you. Would you stand to your feet all over this building? Say, Pastor, how do we, how do we find that, that special place? How do we find the path? It's the same path for every single human being. That path from mistake to miracle is through repentance. It's through saying, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. Jesus modeled it as he struggled in his flesh to go to Calvary and he was praying in the garden of Gethsemane and he got to that point where he had to submit everybody in this building has a free will you have a human spirit we're made up of body soul and spirit everybody but what we do with it is our own prerogative Jesus.
Jesus. My goodness. Jesus. What a word from heaven. Jesus says, I paid for what you did. can't think of a better a better day a better morning a better opportunity than right now for you to step out from where you're standing and come and stand in this altar lift up your hands to the Lord and say Lord here I am I need you to help me I know you forgave me but I'm struggling with forgiving myself I've got questions and I've got doubts but I feel that there's a call in the Holy Ghost that's saying, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Oh, that's beautiful. Just step out from where you're standing. If you can't make it to the altar, maybe right where you're at, you can just lift up your hands right now. And would you begin to thank the Lord? The presence of God is all over this place. I feel like there's a mass healing that's here today. Come on, God wants to heal you. He wants to heal that broken heart. He will heal that broken spirit. His arm is not short. His ear is not deaf. He has all power. He has all authority. That's it all over this building. Lift up your hands right now. Hear my cry today, oh God. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. With my life laid down and surrender now, I give you everything. Because your goodness is running after. It's running after me. 